dearly beloved it's a great delight for my wife and myself to be with you this morning to worship god and also to share god's word with you when we come here we don't come exclusively to preach we come essentially to see you all and to renew our fellowship with all of you especially with those who have worked hand in hand with us during our tenure in this church and who had strengthened our ministry while we were here above all that this soil has got a great fascination for us because while in this congregation i had i had many promotions but the most important promotion was that my wife and i had become grandparents and uh, two of my grandsons through my first daughter were born here and this now they are college going students thanks be to god if my first grandson is graduating in a few days and my second grandson is entering the degree program all born here and they still have very pleasant memories of playing on this campus and whenever we talk about egmore wesley church they don't call it egmore wesley church they say we only long for a time when we would go to madras madras means egmore wesley church with all these present memories i stand here to spend some time reflecting on the word of god the theme for today's meditation is aya the light well sailing illa ipo varudhu unity sunday light on the lamp stand unity sunday light on the lamp stand the four go- lessons prescribed by the church of south india dictionary have been read to us and i want to reflect briefly on each of those lessons because i believe that this lectionary has been prepared intentionally so that we may look at the theme from different different angles and perspectives so i have worked out four sub themes for the old testament lesson the sub theme is purpose of unity purpose of unity according to the lesson Pur- purpose of unity partnership in temple construction partnership in temple construction psalms practice of unity involvement with god transcends differences epistle preoccupation of unity christ the sure foundation gospel proclamation of unity good work proclamation of unity good work purpose of unity partnership in temple construction before i go and have a closer look at the old testament lesson by way of introduction i should like to say that the god of the bible he is essentially a god of partnership god not only a god of partnership he is the origin and he is the source of partnership because in the holy trinity there is father son and holy spirit there is a perfect partnership in holy trinity and when we just gloss over the pages of the bible we see that 
whenever God wanted to work in a decisive way, he brought a few people to work together in partnership. Thus we see in the Old Testament, Abraham and Lot. We see Moses and Aaron. We see Elijah, uh, Elisha, Elijah and Elisha. And we see David and Jonathan. Likewise, in the New Testament, when Jesus, you know, in Mark chapter 6, uh, verse 7, and Luke 9, verse 1 and 2, when Jesus sent his uh, disciples for an orientation program, he sent them two by two. Further, we see in the Acts of Apostles, frequently, Peter and John working together and Paul and Silas working together. And even when we look at the history of the church, during the great Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther had Philip Melanchthon as his partner and John Wesley had Charles Wesley as his partner and the African, the great African evangelist David Livingston had Henry Morton Stanley as his partner. Thus, partnership has been an essential feature in God's economy of doing things. Now coming to this Old Testament passage, we see God laid a burden in the heart of King Darius, the king of the mid of the mid dynasty, King Darius, to reconstruct the Jerusalem temple that was destroyed by the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. We read here in Zechariah chapter 1 verse 16, Therefore thus says the Lord, I have returned to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it, declares the Lord of hosts. And then we read in Haggai chapter 1 14, And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Jerubabel, son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the king of Jehoshaphat, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant people, and they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts. Here we see, especially in the Old Testament passage, God combining together and forming a team consisting of a lay person, a civil servant, Jerubabel, and an ordained priest Joshua that shows that God wants those who are scattered in the outside world and gaining importance as I don't like this word but still we have to use this word as lay people because some people say you say I'm not an expert I'm a layman that is not true in the church because Martin Luther said priesthood of all believers every baptized Christian every confirmed Christian is a priest not just those who wear a dress like this this is this has come to us through church history but according to the spirit of the Bible each one is a priest of God because each one reconciles the world with God. That is his or her priestly function. And each person, according to Martin Luther, is a priest to the other person. He needs to contribute to the <coughs> faith formation of the other person. And each person has to offer pastoral care to the other person. Anyhow, coming back to this passage, in the history of the church, we see from the beginning, moved by the Spirit of God, a few were selected to equip, to equip those who go out and be God's servants and ministers in the world. We read here in Acts chapter 6 verse 2 and 4, 
<coughs> and the twelve summoned the full number of disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. These seven representatives at that time were named as deacons. Those who attend to the administrative affairs of the church and those who are confined to reading of the scriptures, reflecting on the scriptures for going deep into the exposition of the word of God, they were known as presbyters or elders. Dearly beloved, to even today, we need a strong, a deep-seated partnership between the clergy and the laity in our churches. For we read in the words of St. Paul, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12, Paul says, To equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. The partnership is to equip one another. We are all saints in the presence of God. We go to God's presence and say, forgive us sinners. But God says, address us as saints. We read here, the partnership is to equip the saints, the people of God, for the work of the ministry and for the building up of the body of Christ. And in 1 Corinthians 12, 27, we read, and God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, then helping, administering the various kinds of tongues. All these varied ministries belong to all of us. So partnership, working hand in hand together, now I'm just not mentioning about this church, in all the church universal, working together, hand in hand is very, very essential. But I should also add that in the history of the church in different, different continents, the church got contextualized and church began to imitate so many existing st structures in the society. That's why particularly in the, in the Anglican tradition, the bishops have come to, be, come to be known as monarchical bishops, kingly bishops, because they are appointed by the monarch. You know, the, the, the head of the church in England is not, not the archbishop. Of, archbishop only consecrates the bishops, but the head of the church is king. King Charles is the head of the church. And then different, different, different traditions have come up. Presbyterian tradition, where elders join together and run, the, run everything connected to the church. Then the congregational tradition, where the entire congregation is involved in everything connected to the church and the Methodist tradition and so on. But what is essential is for the, revital, for the revitalization and for the edification of the church. We all need to work hand in hand together. That is most important. Secondly, practice of unity, involvement with God transcends differences. Involvement with God transcends differences. In Psalm 27 verse 4, David says, One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Only one thing I have asked, asked, asked of the Lord. What is that? One thing I have asked of the Lord, that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. This refers to the time of prayer. 
excuse me for saying, when I say this, I include myself. Whenever we go to God, it is like going to God with a shopping list. Andare, idveno, adveno, idveno, adveno. Sometimes people even prescribe to God. Kadole, ninga ipudi seino, ninga ipudi seino. But David says, if at all there is one thing that I do in the presence of God, it is to dwell in the presence of the Lord and to gaze, gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. And the explanation of that text is given in Psalm 33 verse 8. There David says, let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. This is what we are missing these days. Standing in the presence of God and experiencing the awesomeness of God's presence. In this, in this world where life becomes more mechanical, we don't have time for that. In Tamil, the translation is Kadavul Samagatil Brahmiti Nindri. Brahmiti Nindri. Experiencing the awesomeness of God's presence. And not only getting involved with God and allowing God to get involved with us. Because, as uh, St. Augustine says, St. Augustine, the great saint says, Lord, you have created me for yourself. You have created me for yourself. And my heart is restless until it finds its rest in you. That's what David says in Psalm 42, 1. As a deer panteth for flowing streams, so panteth my soul for you, O God, my soul, thirst for God, my living God. Mangal Nirodai Vanjit Kadarvadu Pol Yan Atma Kadavale Noki Kadaragiraj. Yes, a deer panteth for the streaming waters. Commentators say, we, I have not seen, gone to forest and had uh, direct experience. They say, when deers feel thirsty, they take any risk. Sometimes they even get into the hands of, or get into the jaws of, jaws of wild animals like tigers and lions, because their only main concern is to quench their thirst. They go hither and thither, searching for water. Likewise, Psalmist says, My heart longeth for thee, O God. When we get into that kind of an experience with God, all these man-made differences in this world, all the so-called son of the soiling, soil feeling in this world, they all become secondary or even tertiary. What is more important is my closeness to God and my closeness to my neighbor. Only that is more important. In this connection, I want to share an imaginary story with you. And uh, to explain the story, I want to use, use this church. Okay, wherever I go, you use that church. So here I want to use this church. You know, a gentleman, a gentleman went from, let's say, Egmore Wesley Church to heaven. Many, several will be there in heaven from Egmore Wesley Church, no doubt about it. But uh, one man, one man or woman went for the first time to heaven. St. Peter was standing there. And uh, Peter said, you know, our Lord said, in my father's home there are many mansions. And so Peter said, I will take you to your mansion. Then uh, that gentleman said, or that lady said, well, standing from here, I see many members of the Egmore Wesley Church. So I will ask them to take me to my mansion. You need not come. Then Peter said, all right. Then uh, Peter gave him the microphone. He said, uh, hello, so-and-so, so-and-so, so-and-so. I come from Egmore Wesley Church. So nice to meet you all. Take me to my mansion. And nobody responded. They were only chit-chatting among themselves. 
and I shouted at the top of his voice, even then nobody responded. Then, along escorted by Peter, he went and met one of his closest friends while on earth. And um, he said, Aya, na yaran teriyada ungulke. Uh, don't you know me? He said, I know you. But here, Egmor Wesley, Matthias, Cathedral, and uh, Mr. Chapel, those labels don't mean anything here. We are all, we are only one label, that we are the sons and daughters of God. So because you said Egmor Wesley Church, I, I did, we didn't respond. Because they are all man-made categories. Here, there's one category, one thing that binds all of us is the name of Jesus Christ. So dearly beloved, when we get close to God, we transcend all kinds of differences. We transcend denominational differences, we transcend religious differences, we transcend cultural differences. All differences disappear. And this is one step forward towards establishing unity. You know, even while I was here, uh, once we had a retreat with Dr. Theodore Williams as a preacher. And Theodore Williams used to say one thing about unity, whether you like it or not, all of us are going to be together under the face of, under the surface of the earth. Under the surface of the earth at Kilpak Cemetery, all of us are going to be together. That being the case, why not all of us be together and over the surface of the earth? Let us not go by these differences. Let us build a rapport with each other. And then the third point, preoccupation of unity, Christ the sure foundation. Preoccupation of unity, Christ the sure foundation. Whenever we talk about unity in this world, particularly in the church, we go to the foundational issues. Foundational issues means they talk about sacraments, they talk about liturgy, uh, they talk about creeds, and then they talk about administrative structures, property matters, financial matters, all those things. They, they, they feel that these are the foundational issues that need to be addressed when we talk about unity. And ultimately, all their initiatives and uh, efforts are counterproductive. But Paul says, Paul says, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation which is Jesus Christ. Like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation which is Jesus Christ. You know, Dr. Sam Kamalesan always used to say, we go by so many absolutes in this world. Denomination is one absolute. Doctrine is one absolute. Your liturgy is one absolute. And then your uh, constitution is one absolute. All these are relative absolutes. But the absolute, absolute is Jesus Christ. Tamil or Solvaranga. Idalla Mudivu. Mudivana Mudivu. Yesu Swami. Mudivana Mudivu. The absolute, absolute is Jesus Christ. That's what Paul says. Your preoccupation should be with the foundational issue that is Jesus Christ. Because unity among believers is his brainchild. Only Jesus prayed for unity among the disciples. He said in his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17 verse 11, Jesus says, Holy Father, keep them in your name which you have given me, that they may be one, even as you and I are one. Keep them in your name so that they may be one, even as you and I are one. Unity being the brainchild of Jesus Christ, only he has to enlighten us about the models of unity. What kind of unity Christ ex expects? When the CSI was formed, 
in the year 1947, our spiritual ancestors were preoccupied with this. We are asking God, there are so many models of unity in this world. God, what is your prescription? What is your model of unity for us to establish one church in this world? We read in the year 1999, 33, 33 church representatives met at Trankobar. Among the 33, 31 were Indians and only two were European missionaries. And the, for, since 1999 until 1947, they were praying, they were studying the word of God, and they were putting their heads and minds and hearts together, exploring what is the direction in which we need to go. When we are creating church union in India, South India, because in the world, the Episcopalians, and Brahmins Kapriyans merged together to form one protected church. Ours is organic unity. Four churches joined together, the Western Methodists, Congregations, Anglicans, and Presbyterians joined together to form one church. And now, being inspired by us, they formed the Church of North India in the year 19. In the year 1971, Anglicans, Presbyterians, Congregationists, Western Methodists, plus Baptists, and disciples of Christ, they formed a union in North India. Now we are exploring for, for union, negotiating with the man in Methodist Church, that is, Methodist Church in India, and also the Matama Syrian Church. Dialogue is going on and Lutheran Church, so that we may form the Bharat Church of India. Bharat Church of India, we all must, we all must pray about it. As a first step, you know, we are following this lectionary. The lectionary is a, is a product, is a fruit of the combined effort of the CSI, CNI and Mahatma. Now we are having closer fellowship so that the Mahatma priest can come to CSI and celebrate Holy Communion and preach. CSI priest can go to a CMA church, preach the word of God and celebrate Holy Communion. So the Spirit of God is guiding us because our preoccupation is in Jesus Christ, the sure foundation of the church. Last week, proclamation of unity, the good work. Lord Jesus Christ said, Matthew 5, 14 to 16, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. But I must stand the this light in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. This is a very familiar passage to all of us. Here, light is compared, is used as imagery to explain unity. Light is very, very essential for us when we live in this world. Sunlight, moonlight, and also candlelight. All kinds of lights are very essential to dispel darkness in this world. And also, to say your unity, your unity is a lampstand, your unity is a lamppost, your, your unity has to inspire and guide people in this world. Other people need to understand, people speaking different languages, people belong to different cultural orientations, people with different customs and practices, with all kinds of other subsidiary things, it is possible for all of you to live together as one family. It is possible. How is it possible? Look at this, my family. Look at the church. They are living together. People who speak different, different languages, who belong to different, different communities, before becoming Christians, 
for different different practices. They all have become one flock with one shepherd, Jesus Christ. So we are something like a sample, something like an illustration, an example that Jesus presents to the outside world. The light of the world. Church is the light of the world. And we read in Galatians chapter 3, verses 28 to 29. Paul says, here in the church, in the church, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male or female who are all born in Christ. In the outside world, the relationships are very, very hierarchical, criminal, but inside the church, they are all brothers and sisters. And we go to the Lord's table. This is clearly illustrated in the letter to Philemon. In the letter to Philemon, Paul writes like this. Paul writes to the to, to, to Philemon about his name. His name Onesimus. Paul writes because Onesimus was a slave of Philemon and a runaway slave. Then he eventually seeks shelter with Paul. And under the influence of Paul, he becomes a different man. And Paul sends him back to Philemon, saying, He is coming to you no longer a bond slave, but more than a bond slave, a beloved brother. More than a bond slave, a beloved brother. Dear beloved, this is the relationship, this is the unity that we need to demonstrate in the outside world. In conclusion, I want to say one thing and close. Revelation chapter 9, verse, chapter 7, verse 9. The vision of John the Divine. He says, John 7, 9. After that I looked and behold a great multitude, no one could number, standing before the throne and before the God. In heaven, before the throne of God, a big multitude, different people of different languages, different nations, different customs and practices, they are all assembled before the throne of God. And we need to actualize it. We need to make it clear in this world. That is a challenge for us. Here in the I think I have spoken enough. And uh, I take a view of you. It was so nice to meet you all. And uh, thank you, Pastor, very much in my life. A close friend of mine and a younger brother in the ministry for giving me this opportunity. May God bless you all. And uh, we still cherish present memories of our association with you all and our uh, ministry in our ministry. And your prayers continue to sustain all of us. God be all of